Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, I'll start off with a few quick disclosures. First, uh, uh, the MGH experience that's described here is my own. There's many groups at MGH, uh, and, and I'll just refer to, uh, to my own experiences and, and perspective. Um, Second thing, I'm going to take a different approach than Rich did. Uh, I won't talk too much about the nuts and bolts. I'm do, going to do more of a survey of the types of uh, work that we've done. Uh, I'll hint at some of the tools that we've used, and then we can discuss a little bit uh, as your interests dictate. Uh, third thing, I have more material than I can cover in 10 minutes, so I'm going to use up my time, zip to the end, and then we'll talk. OK. Uh, so the Gordon Center for Medical Imaging, that's my, my academic home at MGH. Um, as it stands right now in 2023, uh, it's very different than when I arrived in, uh, in 2011, uh, something we can talk about uh, as time permits. Um, uh, right now we have a number of compounds available for human use, not as many as Rich does. Um, we have a lot of uh, IRB protocols, uh, IACUC protocols, and today, uh, we're doing everything from cell culture up through human studies uh, and everything in between mice, rats, rabbits, woodchucks, uh, occasionally um, sheep, uh, pigs, monkeys, um, all the like. Uh, most of these are recent developments. Um, you may ask why I'm mentioning this. Uh, believe it or not, kinetics plays a key role in almost all of these projects. Um, uh, it, it truly influences, uh, at a foundational level, all the work that we do. Uh, so jumping into uh, a, a few uh, illustrative examples, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the tau uh, brain tracer flirtausip here. Um, uh, so we did uh, some of the first kinetic modeling with this compound. Uh, we had early access uh, thanks to a relationship with Siemens uh, uh, molecular imaging. And uh, we, uh, we did the, the, the full kinetic analysis. We did uh, where are we? There we are. Uh, we did our, our blood work uh, with metabolite analysis. We did our rigorous compartmental modeling. We looked at alternative quantification methods. Uh, we looked at uh, blood-free methods. I've lost my. No. How'd you do that, Rich? Gone. Okay. Then. There it is. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, importantly, we uh, uh, we took a look at the the popular approach of doing a static acquisition window uh, at a, at a late time point. In this case, uh, we optimized for 80 to 100 minutes. We found that that was a reasonable surrogate for doing uh, full kinetic modeling. Uh, you can generate parametric maps, and SUVR is not a perfect outcome, but it is serviceable. Um, our clinical collaborators uh, really jumped on this, uh, started using it quite extensively. Uh, shown here is one early example uh, where they did cross-sectional studies, uh, essentially doing in vivo uh, BRAC staging uh, across the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, works quite well. Uh, the uh, criticism, of course, is that this is cross-sectional and it's in vivo. Uh, how do we know that it's true? Um, well, we can't uh, get around that cross-sectional component of it, but we can uh, take out pieces of people's brains after they're dead. Um, the, uh, they've consented to this, of course, antemortem, uh, and cross-sectionally by autoradiography, a uh, technique that I years ago had no anticipation of getting involved in, but now it's a it's, uh, daily routine for us. Uh, autoradiography confirms that this uh, in vivo finding cross-sectionally does appear to be valid. Cross-sectional is one thing, uh, what happens in individual people. Um, so shown here in uh, Bernard Hansu's uh, JAMA Neurology paper uh, as an example of one individual uh, as the, uh, he progressed uh, over three years in early stages of cognitive decline. Uh, so we're able to pick up on relatively subtle changes. Uh, so flatosip here is useful. It is not perfect. Uh, through some of those autoradiography studies, we were able to identify uh, some of the first work uh, uh, looking at some of the off-target binding sites uh, that this tracer exhibits. Um, and there are also some discrepancies 
between in vivo and postmortem data sets, especially in non-AD telepathies. This is something that we've observed for years. We still don't have a complete understanding of it. If you do, please come talk to me later. Uh, so the need for better tau tracers uh, continues. Uh, enter MK6240. Um, I will break the news. It's also imperfect, uh, but in many ways it is better. Um, we repeated many of the same things that I just described for Latausapir. Uh, we did our uh, invasive blood sampling with metabolite analysis, uh, full kinetic modeling, comparison of methods, um, uh, assessment of simplified techniques, parametric mapping, and the like. One thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is something that uh, initially was being viewed as a potential problem. Uh, MK6240 has very high affinity for tau. Um, it has very fast blood clearance, and it has rather high permeability. It gets into the brain quickly, and some people feared that this combination of factors would make it essentially irreversible kinetics. It would act like a microsphere, and you'd, all you'd measure is flow instead of tau. Uh, so we looked at that in the data uh, that's shown here on the left, um, and uh, we can see empirically that our binding outcomes do not appear to be biased by perfusion. Uh, we you know, thought that this might actually be an advantage and started looking at whether or not uh, MK6240 data could give us a, uh, not just a measure of tau burden, but also a measure of perfusion. Uh, our initial work was to compare against sort of a silver standard. Um, Carbon-11 PIB uh, has been validated previously against O15 water uh, as being able to give appropriate um, perfusion indices, uh, and we get very good correlation between MK6240 and PIB. Um, uh, here are just uh, some examples highlighting the fact uh, that we can generate very nice parametric maps. Uh, we uh, see that where there's tau burden, we have re reduced perfusion, um, and we can see uh, at a cross-sectional level comparing controls and MCIs and AD subjects uh, that there appears to be some uh, hypoperfusion developing over time, uh, and if you do the statistics um, region-wise, uh, that, that becomes quantifiable. Uh, next, I'll jump to a different tracer, 3F4AP. Um, this was developed uh, uh, as a uh, way to image demyelination uh, by targeting potassium channels that are normally buried under the myelin sheath and get exposed uh, on demyelinating injuries. Um, we did uh, a series of studies in rodents uh, that I won't show here. I'll quickly mention uh, one monkey scan that we did. And uh, purely by coincidence, uh, we noticed this little bright spot uh, right here at sort of the, the front of the brain. Um, we scanned this monkey with a number of different traces, had never seen anything like that. Um, and in fact, we didn't even know that there was anything there. This is an animal we got from a, someone else's colony and uh, it had um, previously uh, had a, a minor brain injury in that area during a surgical procedure. Uh, so an incidental uh, model of, of brain injury and presumably demyelination. Um, we've since gone on to do first in human studies, doing dosimetry um, and then dedicated brain imaging studies and recently moved on to imaging in patient populations, including multiple sclerosis. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I will talk ab uh, about uh, myocardial perfusion imaging. Um, the, the work that we're doing here is trying to condense a normally uh, two-scan procedure uh, to do rest and stress imaging and to do them in a single session where we give uh, the stressor in, in the middle and we incorporate time-varying parameters and model uh, the changes in perfusion. Uh, this was demonstrated uh, using F18 flirpiridase in pigs, uh, and we validated that uh, with microspheres. Uh, we demonstrated it with N13 ammonia in pigs, um, and also demonstrated uh, with the same tracer in human subjects. Um, we also do a lot of cardiac studies uh, investigating mitochondrial membrane potential. Uh, just to, to quickly go through here, the radio tracer that we're using is shown here on the left. It's a radio-labeled lipophilic cation. Basically, it's a charged grease ball. It easily goes through membranes, and the charge means that uh, it will distribute 
uh, across those membranes in accordance with the Nernst potential uh, with electrochemical gradients. Uh, we can essentially rewrite the Nernst equation uh, in terms of how it would be observed um, in, in a PET setting, um, and we can relate that to the total volume of distribution. Um, and then we can invert that to infer from our PET data uh, what the, uh, the, 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 the membrane potential across uh, the, the mitochondrial membrane is. Um, we've done several validation studies in this uh, and development work. Uh, two that I'll quickly highlight are um, a, a pig model in, where we did uh, surgical uh, catheterization of a coronary artery um, and infused a compound called BAM15. It's a proton uncoupler, uh, transiently uh, uh, eliminates uh, or dramatically reduces uh, the mitochondrial membrane potential. Uh, and we can see here that we get a steep drop uh, transiently in the region that's perfused by that uh, catheter. Um, likewise, looking at something a bit more clinically relevant, uh, we did essentially the same protocol but with the chemotherapeutic doxorubicin, um, and we get a more modest uh, but, but still uh, discernible effect. Um, I'm essentially out of time, but I'll quickly uh, just say that we, uh, we don't just work with small molecules. We also work with radio-labeled nanoparticles. Uh, we do this for imaging, uh, especially for tracking of immune cells, uh, and that's all, again, done with uh, kinetics in mind. And more recently, uh, we've started developing uh, ther theranostic, I hate the term, but there it is, uh, uh, versions of this uh, to do therapy um, with some very spectacular, I would say, rodent results right now that we're looking forward to expanding on. Uh, so to wrap up, um, building a kinetics program has been challenging but rewarding. Uh, we're always seeking trade-offs, uh, tr trying to figure out what works um, uh, and uh, what works uh, experimentally in terms of science and what works in terms of real life. Um, and it's a f this is a field that operates at the interface of many different disciplines, and that brings a lot of challenges, requires a lot of different uh, forms of expertise, um, lots of equipment, and the studies themselves are expensive. With that comes some great opportunities, uh, always something to learn, uh, some potential collaborations that are uh, spectacular, uh, and we can do science together that we couldn't do uh, in isolation. Uh, just to follow up on the expense and the collaborations, I want to quickly acknowledge our funding sources um, at the NIH and the Gordon Foundation uh, and the many collaborators who have contributed over the years. Thank you.